the Clayman Institute for Gender Research at Stanford University. Reinvigorating gender equality in the 21st century. I am Lynn Westfall, I am, and I am really privileged to be able to welcome all of you today to, this, to celebrate this trailblazing career of Dr. Iris Litt, and a special welcome to all of her family and close friends who probably came from far and wide today. I first met Dr. Litt almost exactly 28 years ago when I rotated through her clinic as a medical student. I still remember one of those adolescent girls that I met that day and the discussion that we had about her. At the time, I knew Dr. Litt as a dedicated physician and the founder of the Adolescent Medicine Clinic, an area in which she was nationally known. It was only later that I realized that she wore so many other hats and did it so effortlessly. Today is a time to reflect on how much we have gained at the medical school and the entire university from the vision of Dr. Litt and some of her fellow pioneers that we're fortunate to have today with us too. As you will hear about in more detail later, the Center for Research on Women was established at Stanford in 1974 and eventually became the Clayman Institute for Gender Research with a few names in between. <laughs> Historically, some of the Institute's work focused on women's health with conferences and seminars and a course for junior faculty focusing on women's health research and achieving academic success. Dr. Litt and her colleagues recognized many years ago that the health needs of women extend far beyond the reproductive system, include a wide range of conditions that are unique to women, more prevalent or serious in women, or are inadequately addressed in women. Because of Dr. Litt's position in the medical center and the main campus, she was able to build unique collaborations. In 1997, the Stanford University Women's Health Research Center was established within the institute with Dr. Litt as its director and with Dr. Linda Judice as the associate director. Seed money was obtained to fund research projects in women's health conducted by Stanford faculty in a variety of disciplines. Funding for small grants for junior faculty through the Iris Litt Fund were offered through the Institute. In 1999, the School of Medicine awarded a multidisciplinary research program in women's health and gender-based biology grant to four women, Dr. Litt from pediatrics, Dr. Judice from OBGYN, Dr. Stefanik from medicine, and Dr. Casper from psychiatry. The goals of this three-year grant were to promote the exchange of ideas among researchers, leading to multidisciplinary collaborations that would contribute significantly to studies in women's health and the basis of gender and sex differences in clinical and molecular medicine. Two years later, in 2001, the Institute of Medicine issued a landmark report on its findings that sex is a basic human variable that should be considered in designing and analyzing studies in all areas of basic and clinical research, emphasizing that every cell has sex. That same year, these research and care entities that were um, being formed in women's health at Stanford were brought together under an umbrella organization called Women's Health at Stanford, and that planned to integrate all women's health services and research at Stanford. This multidisciplinary initiative was established through support from the Dean of the School of Medicine, Stanford University Hospital, and the Department of Gynecology and Obstetrics. Linda Judice was the first director, and Dr. Litt was a key member of that advisory board. Their vision was to provide comprehensive health care for women across their lifespan, through cutting edge research, patient and provider education, high quality patient care, and advocacy. In 2005, when Dr. Judice moved to UCSF to become the chair of obstetrics and gynecology there, I was fortunate to become the director of that program. Several years later, Dean Pizzo provided funding for a strategic planning process to expand the program. The Lit Fellowship provided funding for me to be able to focus on this project, which I was doing in collaboration with Dr. Stefanik, who had also been a Lit Fellow in the past. This past January, we launched our program as the Stanford Center for Health Research on Women and Sex Differences, which we have shortened 
to women and sex differences in medicine, or WISDOM. The WISDOM mission promotes what Dr. Litt started years ago, advancing human health across the lifespan through research and education in women's health, biology of sex differences, and gender medicine. Like Dr. Litt has done her whole career, we are trying to engage the entire Stanford campus and promote new and unique collaborations. Our Wisdom Center exists today because of the vision of Dr. Litt and colleagues and her support of women and women's health issues. I think she created one of the original lean-in circles at Stanford. <laughs> to continue her legacy, we plan to create an alumni group of Clayman Fellows to carry on her vision. Thank you, Dr. Litt, for pa paving the way for so many of us and for so many of these important programs. So next, Andrea Davies will give us a history of the Clayman Institute. I'm Andrea Davies. I'm the Associate Director at the Clayman Institute. And more than giving a history of the Clayman Institute, and I'm a historian, so don't get me started on that topic, um, I really want to introduce Dr. Litt and her role at the Clayman Institute and how influential that was. Um, back when she was the director from 1990 to 97, it had a different name, as we heard earlier. It was the Institute for Research on Women and Gender, and the name change to the Clayman Institute has everything to do with Dr. Litt. But tonight you're going to hear from a diverse group of academics who are all honoring Iris, Iris Litt's deep commitment to gender research and building an interdisciplinary community here at Stanford that creates change. Now the Clayman Institute was founded, as you heard, um, many years ago in 1974 under a different name. And even then it was one of the first research institutes in the country that focused on gender. Now the research then, as it does now, crossed disciplinary boundaries, but that's back before it was fashionable to do so. And as the director of the Institute in the 90s, Dr. Iris Litt made that the core mission and really the core legacy of the Institute. Now you'll hear tonight, and I'm sure you already know why you're here, is that Dr. Iris Litt is so well known for her pioneering research and work in medicine. But at the Clayman Institute, we know her in a different way and we continue to benefit from her role as a director at the Institute. She was an impressive leader at Stanford, and this was what ties to our name change. So I spoke with Michelle Clayman. Um, she's a Stanford alum who's very interested in gender equality, and you might have noticed that there's a connection between Michelle Clayman and the Clayman Institute. Um, and the Clayman Institute was renamed in 2006. This is several years after Dr. Litt was part of our community. But the reason for the name change has to do with her role while she was director. So in speaking with Michelle Clayman, she very much remembers the first time she met you. It was 1993. You were a few years into your directorship. It was a speaking engagement in New York. Michelle Clayman was so impressed, she went up to speak with you. And the conversation she recalls didn't last as long as she had wished. And you, um, I think the quote was, invited Michelle to stop by whenever she was on campus, and Michelle Clayman did. And after that visit, here's what Michelle Clayman had to say. She says, I was so impressed with her and saw such potential in the Institute that I promised her then and there, if I was ever successful, I would make sure the Institute was successful too. And that has happened. And Michelle Clayman says in her words, so we have Iris to thank for a lot. And she also included, I adore Iris. <laughs> After her term ended as director, we established the Iris Lit Fund, which funds fellows at the Clayman Institute. This started in 1997, and since then has funded, I went through the files, so many research projects on gender that across all disciplines, not just the School of Medicine. Mm -hmm. But more recently, I think what's more exciting about this fellowship is it allows um, professors from the medical school to join us and other Stanford faculty, really bridging the gap between the humanities and sciences and the medical school. And they join us for a full year, sharing their research knowledge at the medical school and also hearing from a range of topics, including um, ants from a biologist or the history of feminism in the US from a historian. 
Um, so I won't speak more about that because we're lucky enough tonight to hear from some of the Lit Fellows and hear about how influential this opportunity was, really started by Iris Lit and something that continues to influence all of us at the Clayman Institute today. So with that, I want to say um, it's an honor to have you here and to do this. And I'd like to introduce Roberta Katz, who's going to speak a little bit more about your influential role at Stanford. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. It, this is such a pleasure to be here to honor you, Iris. Um, you have made a mark for so many people. And I'm here to talk about yet another role that Iris has played, and that has been twice she has been director of the Center for Advanced Studies in the Behavioral Sciences. And you say, well, wait, where's medicine in this? This is a whole other aspect of Iris's career. What is CASBIS? CASBIS is a very preeminent interdisciplinary center. It's um, up on the hill, as we say, not too far from the main part of campus. And it has been, for many years, the place where preeminent social scientists go to spend a year. They, um, they come from a variety of disciplines, and they, they are free to do their own work while they're up there. With, they have one uh, sort of mandatory obligation. They have to come together at lunch. And when they come together at lunch, all sorts of interesting interdisciplinary conversations happen. The fellows say that their year at CASBIS, they, they almost uniformly say their year at CASBIS was life-changing, that new ideas professionally came to them that turned out to be very important, but that personally also their lives were changed. And Iris... Um, as I say, has been, has been the director twice. This second time, she stepped in to fill a need. The, the, uh, the previous director stepped down unexpectedly. We didn't have a search process in place. We were quite worried. And uh, the dean of research, Ann Arvin, uh, called Iris and said, is there any way you could do this? And she very graciously agreed to come do this until we select a, a, her successor. Um, her tenure at CASBIS has really demonstrated her, her qualities. And I'm only going to highlight four of those qualities, but they have been very, very evident in her leadership at CASBIS. So the first is clarity. Iris exudes clarity. She walks in to what, whatever setting um, it, it is, and her clarity lets everybody know everything's okay. And this was very important um, in this most recent um, tenure at CASBIS because the, the organization was suffering a little bit. And there was a feeling that, um, that the organization was adrift. And almost from the minute Iris walked in, you could, you could, you could almost tangibly feel the sigh of relief that happened there. It was clarity. And it was a willingness to, to accept the responsibility uh, with grace. So that was the first, uh, the first quality that was demonstrated. The second one was respect. We have scholars from so many different disciplines and so many different stages of their careers. And Iris demonstrated respect for every single one of them. Interest in what they were doing and respect for them as individuals. And it's very fascinating. I'm an anthropologist. I'm fascinated in watching what people do when, you, when they're given respect. They become their better selves. So Iris, I, for every one of these fellows, I think, was allowing them to become their better selves. And she does it not just at CASBIS. I've seen her do it all over the place. It's a wonderful quality that you respect others. I have to say, I have never heard Iris say a negative word about anybody. And even in settings where I, I have a strong suspicion, she's thinking, what is that person doing? But she will never, ever say anything uh, uh, bad. And it's a, it's a lovely quality. Um, the last, or the, the third thing I'm going to highlight is her quiet power. So as I said, Iris came into an institution that was listing. It was a ship that was listing. And she very quietly, with that clarity, set about fixing, attending to every problem that had become exposed over the prior period of years. And she did it without, without advertising that that's what she was going to do. She just came in and very quietly, I saw her do it in so many areas, the financial area, the staffing area, the, uh, the, the, 
the sense of community among the fellows. She just quietly set about fixing everything. And within a matter of months, the place was healthy. And so we think of Dr. Litt as, as healing individuals. I also think of Dr. Litt as healing institutions. So, and it's with that quiet power. And the last um, attribute, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, but the last attribute is generosity. In order for her to step into this role, she had to substantially change her life. And so not only did she postpone some um, uh, anticipated travel, and thank you, Dale, for that, uh, <laughs> because Dale also played a role in this. Um, she had some uncommitted time that suddenly was not just committed, but very committed, as she is, uh, is wont to say, this job has been a more than full-time job. Um, she had to set up a new home because she was not living near Stanford, so she had to set up a new home. And all the while, she was very carefully saying, how long do you think it will take to find a new director? And we kept saying, uh, don't worry, it might take a little longer, but, and she very graciously kept saying, okay, just don't forget. But um, she did that really from, uh, with a generosity it, because she cared about the institution, but most importantly, she cared about the people associated with that institution. And to have, to, to have um, put herself second out of a love for others is, I, I just think it doesn't get any better than that. So Iris, on behalf of the CASBIS board and all the fellows and so on, thank you. It's a little hard <laughs> at this point after hearing all these lovely comments. Thank you very much. I have lots of thank yous. As I look around this room, I, I have to say that whatever I've been able to do here or elsewhere is because I've been surrounded by so many wonderful, loving, supportive people. And starting with my family, uh, of my immediate family, uh, we are very well represented here today. The, uh, Litz and the Vaughns and the Garrels, uh, and that really means a lot to me. And I want to say to Bill, my son, there he is, that you and your brother and your father uh, really p allowed me never to have to make a choice between career and family. And I am forever indebted to you for that because I, it would have been impossible. I also want to um, add my thanks about the Institute for Research on Women and Gender, formerly Crow, and starting with um, Myra Strober and Marilyn Yalom, who started it all. And I am so thrilled to see what the center is today under Shelley's leadership and to recognize how many, uh, what has happened in these many years. And to thank Michelle Clayman, who couldn't be here because of her generosity and support. Uh, we are the strong institution that we are today. But I don't want to forget Barbara Finberg, who endowed the directorship of the institute, who uh, did that at a very critical time in our history. I think without her, there would be no institute today. And uh, we can't talk about the past of the institute without also recognizing Jean Lyman and her very special support and advocacy, excuse me, advocacy at the highest levels of the university. And the late Susan Heck, who with her other Graduate students, I think, came to Myra and uh, originally had the idea for setting up a center like this. So um, we remember them very fondly. You've heard and you will hear more about the Iris Lit Fund, and you heard that it was set up on the occasion of my retirement from um, the center and uh, my return to full-time adolescent medicine. That. Uh, fund was actually originally established by the associates of the Institute for Research on Women and Gender, some of whom 
are here today. I saw uh, Catherine Lada and Marianne Matsumoto, and I may have missed some of you who may have come in later, but it, it was really an act of, of, of foresight and generosity by that group that has made this all possible. I um, want to also recognize and thank all of my colleagues in the School of Medicine, some of whom you heard about, and I think Linda Judice just walked in, and I'm thrilled to see her because she was part of the group that uh, worked so hard to try to get a toehold in the School of Medicine um, in the early days. And I'm so pleased that wisdom is finally there, and I think we are established now. Um, so I've been asked to give some recollections and reflections and to um, probably Eric Lander put it best. Uh, by saying that you live your life prospectively and then you tell your story retrospectively so it looks like everything is converging. <laughs> In the spirit of his comment, I'll pretend that my research over all of these years was guided by a vision and a goal. <laughs> but in fact, that's very far from the truth because what I have always done is to uh, study problems that have arisen in the course of my taking care of patients, uh, questions that have arisen for which there are no answers. You've got to do research to find out what the answers are, and that really has been the guiding principle. The story of my involvement with the center, this center, started um, well, I guess it really started as um, you just heard from Roberta that I was I was a fellow at the Center for Research, excuse me, at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences in 1984-85, and it was that experience that really informed um, and changed my perspective in terms of recognizing the importance of working closely with behavioral scientists and people in the humanities. Um, and I would say that primed me for what subsequently happened. And the story, the direct story of the um, relationship with the now Clayman Institute began back in early 1990. And I came home and found a message on my uh, voice machine. We had machines in those days. <laughs> and it was from Myra Strober, who uh, said that she and the late Diane Middlebrook were the search committee for a new director for mm -hmm. the center. And uh, she wanted me to call her back. So upon hearing that message, I compiled a list of people I knew on campus who were doing research on women and gender. It was a very short list, I might say. But I returned the call only to hear Myra say, no, we wanted to talk to you about being the director of this center. And I said, but my research is on adolescents. I don't do women's research. And she said, we've got to talk. <laughs> and talk we did. And what I realized, and it may be hard to recognize at this point in time, but what I realized then for the first time is that while I had always thought that I was doing research on health issues of adolescents, they were mainly problems uh, like eating disorders, pregnancy prevention, adherence to medication, uh, some prisoners thrown in. But all of my research was, in fact, on adolescent women. And honestly, I had never, ever thought about the gender differences before that moment. So I thank you. Uh, and to say that it was, it was a transformative experience for me. And I realized after I said yes, I would accept this challenge and learn about women's health and about women's issues. And I realized that there might be 
other people who are doing research on this campus uh, who might be in a similar position. And I went about meeting with my colleagues, mainly in the medical school, but elsewhere on the campus, and posed that question. I said, have you ever analyzed your data uh, with regard to the gender of your subjects or patients? And the response was astonishing. I can't say that it was 100%, but many of my colleagues, like myself, had just never thought about it before. And uh, over the course of those seven years, we really had a lot of fun exploring all of these previously hidden um, insights into um, a lot of aspects of uh, women's and men's health. And what grew out of that experience was that we uh, began a lecture series in women's health for undergraduates. We began holding seminars and conferences, publications, and a book came out of the uh, experience. And I, I want to say I don't, yes, Edie is here. I was going to say that uh, it was a sort of a bi-directional experience because you may know that most of the scholars at the center, uh, at, at that time, in fact, none were from medicine, so they were all from the humanities and the behavioral sciences. And I did worry a little bit that by bringing this focus on women's health to the center that I might be uh, disenfranchising some people. And I have, I'm pointing, an embarrassing Edie, but she is a very prominent historian of the American Revolution. And she announced one day after we had been talking about all of these women's health issues that she was writing a book on breast cancer in Abigail Adams' daughter. And that to me just underscored uh, the value of this interdisciplinary um, interchange and enrichment that we all experienced at that time. It was very, very exciting. But I also want to point out that the timing of my appointment to the center in 1990 um, was a very, um, let's say, time, timely one in the sense that it was just about then that the entire country was becoming aware of the deficits in our knowledge about women's health. And that's really largely owing to the work of the Congressional Women's Caucus, uh, specifically um, Pat Schroeder, Democrat from Colorado, and Olympia Snow, Republican from Maine, who together had focused on the fact that in all of the time that um, the, uh, the, uh, the NIH had been in, uh, in operation, only 11% of the budget of the NIH went to study anything that had to do with women's health, however defined. And the two of them and their colleagues in the caucus went about to um, finally to um, develop and get passed something called the Women's Health Equity Act, H.R. 3075. And that was a very far-reaching act which uh, set down rules, for example, and this is just one very small example. Prior to that legislation, uh, there were no guidelines or rules about women getting mammograms, for example, nor was there any uh, system of oversight for providers of mammograms. And they looked at every aspect of women's health and really began to uh, develop legislation. Because of their increasing awareness about the need for more information about women's health, uh, finally there was the um, Office of Women's Health of the National Institute of Health, uh, of the CDC, of the FDA. Uh, so there were these centers of interest and awareness uh, throughout our government. But the, at the time, uh, the 
the concept of women's health was still quite narrow. And as Lynn indicated, uh, women's health issues were largely defined by their reproductive role. So that uh, while people knew uh, the importance of breast cancer and uterine cancer and cervical cancer uh, in causing death and um, disability in women, the idea that there were more deaths among women at that time from heart disease, from lung cancer, was something that wasn't even on the radar screen. And what began to happen after all of this legislation was passed and these um, in, uh, organizations were now um, populated by people with interest in, in women's health was that there was, began to be a lot of pushback. And I began to hear among my colleagues, well, you know, women live seven years longer than men. What's, you know, why don't we do something to improve the health of men? And that was really a, a prevailing attitude. What nobody recognized at that point was that those extra seven golden years that women enjoy on average were in general um, spent in a state of uh, disability and uh, dependency and often in poverty. So out of that recognition, people began redefining life expectancy. And instead of looking at absolute life expectancy, now we've introduced the concept um, of active life expectancy, expectancy, so introducing a qualitative aspect to it. And I think that has been very helpful in recognizing that once you did that, there really was no uh, advantage among women over men. So the, the reason I began thinking about why we knew so little about women's health at that point. Here we are in the richest country in the world, uh, so many millions, billions of dollars being spent on health research. Why did we know so little about women? Uh, and it was only 23 years ago that we're talking about. Well, it, it ha it's an interesting history because if you think about how our knowledge about health comes about or did come about, um, back in the early days, I would say before uh, the 70s, most of the research that was done on health issues was done on medical students. And who were the medical students? They were men. 90% of medical students in those days were men. So. Uh, and I should say most of them were not volunteers in the true sense, but, uh, <laughs> but they were somehow coerced into being subjects before uh, stringent laws came into effect. But in any case, that was the database. And if you look beyond that, yes, there was research being done uh, on drugs by pharmaceutical companies, that was always the case. But there again, uh, you may or may not know that women were specifically excluded from participation <clears throat> in drug research because, well, first of all, there are hormonal fluctuations in the course of their uh, days, and that might have an adverse effect on uh, drug metabolism. Therefore, don't put them in the studies. I'll get back to that one in a minute. But the other reason they were often excluded uh, was that, well, they may be pregnant, and if we expose them to a drug, it may have an adverse effect on their fetus. The thought that they might ask women and uh, have them make the decision as to whether they should or could be subjects in a research study, believe it or not, was not really considered. So um, the, the database on which we've done all of this planning and all that we knew about women's health was really derivative and very little of it was specifically derived from women themselves. But now that we've had uh, more awareness, I talked about the work of the Congressional Women's Caucus. I'll also say that uh, the um, 
I mentioned that the Office of Women's Health was established in the FDA, and it, they mandated that women be included in drug studies, um, which is surely a step in the right direction. Uh, there was the uh, a number of longitudinal studies were launched to focus specifically on the health issues of women, and of course the Women's Health Initiative, which Marcia has been the PI for, and is one of the most important. There was also the Longitudinal Nurses Study that's recently been expanded, and believe it or not, uh, the Department of Defense made a major effort in terms of research on breast cancer. Uh, so there were a lot of good things going on. The Society for Women's Health research was developed. There are journals on women's health. Um, and there's a lot now that we have to go on, and a lot of progress has been made. But before we start celebrating, let me just mention that we still have a ways to go. Specifically, as you may know, the Women's um, Congressional caucus was disbanded in 1994 after the Newt Gingrich sweep. Uh, that's gone. The Office of Women's Health of the NIH, which was a, at the time a great hope to us all, was given a budget of $2 million a year for the first year. If you have any idea what the cost of the other 27 institutes of the National Institute of Health get, it's in the um, billions at this point. Uh, the reason, the alleged reason for doing that was kind of interesting. They decided that they didn't want to ghettoize women's health. They wanted women's health to take place in all of the 27 institutes of health. So by not funding that particular office, they um, expected that this would happen. And needless to say, it is not. The, um, I mentioned that now women must be included in drug studies, and that's definitely a step in the right direction. However, there is no uh, requirement that sufficient numbers of women be included in these drug studies so that you can have uh, a statistically significant finding. So you just have to throw, <laughs> throw some women in, and then you're in compliance if you're a drug company. The fact that we now know from other studies that hormones, uh, particularly estrogen and progesterone, have a very profound effect on both the absorption of drugs, um, the metabolism of drugs, the excretion of drugs, and um, failure to take that into consideration in the selection of uh, subjects in these drug studies is really, um, um, I would say, malpractice if we're talking about um, health care. But to say that it, we're missing an, a very important opportunity to learn um, about how drugs and their effects are different in women at different stages of the menstrual cycle, at different pubertal stages, women pre- and post-menopausal. And this isn't just an intellectual uh, interest. It, if you think about uh, the impact of not having the necessary information as a physician, uh, the, the information you need in order to properly prescribe a drug, uh, and recognizing that if, and there are now a few very small studies, self-funded studies, that show that for some drugs, uh, if you give the standard dose that was designed uh, on the basis of studies on men. If you give that standard dose uh, to a menstruating woman, you'll find that at one half of the menstrual cycle, the level of that drug in her bloodstream is too low to have any effect. And at the other uh, half of the menstrual cycle, the level is so high as to be toxic. It's not to say that that's true for all drugs, but it truly is for a number of them. And we have no idea. And we know that women are prescribed many more drugs than are men, and we're, we're doing that as physicians without any information, and that's really quite, quite upsetting. The, um, 
I don't know how many of you saw, but just last week there was a report of a 400% increase in drug overdo overdose deaths among women in the last year. And this has, uh, I think the implication was that this is um, intentional or suicidal, but knowing what we know about uh, the absence of appropriate data on drug metabolism in women, it worries me uh, that some of that could very well have been um, the women taking their drugs as prescribed, but without really knowing what their needs and capabilities were for metabolizing the, uh, the drugs. There are so many other examples. We obviously don't have time, but there surely still are gender differences in the um, access and distribution of um, limited resources like uh, organs for transplantation, and even in the diagnosis of heart disease, there are still gender differences in that. And as we go on, we still know very little about health issues for ethnic minority women, um, and surely for sexual minority people. And we, on the other side of the ledger, know very little about so-called women's diseases like osteoporosis or eating disorders in men, and they are really important issues, and we need to know more about them. So as we go forward, uh, besides trying to fill the data gap and all, all the information that we still need, uh, I think we also have to remember the importance of trying to understand the precursors and the risk factors for some diseases that are to be found in childhood and even before that, and focus on how to prevent some of the many uh, illnesses that we have to deal with and that are costing so much for society. And of course, as I learned early on at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, we really have to know more about how to change behavior of patients and physicians in order to improve the health of all of our people. So thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, Iris and I actually went to college together. <laughs> we were both at Cornell and then realized uh, sometime in the 70s, uh, because of our mothers, that's right. Our mothers became friends. Mm -hmm. And that's when we each realized that the other was here. So Iris, it is just such a pleasure to honor you today. And I know everybody else here feels the same. And it's wonderful to be here and look out at all of you and see all of the um, history of the Institute, um, particularly Marilyn Yalom, who's sitting right up front here. And um, my first foray uh, into interdisciplinarity was when we uh, made one of the best decisions ever and hired Marilyn Yalom to come and work for the Center for Research on Women. Marilyn's field is literature, and um, she began to develop the program of the uh, Center in the Humanities. And I just see so many people here who've had a role in that, Edie Gellis and Karen Offen and Sue Bell. And I came back in uh, 2000 from a two-year stay at Atlantic Philanthropies in Ithaca, New York, which I was delighted to go back to since I had been at Cornell for four years. And I was in charge of the higher education program for Atlantic Philanthropies. And one of the things that I got interested in was uh, the structure of knowledge, as we called it particularly interdisciplinarity. How does interdisciplinarity work? So I realized that I had been interdisciplinary all these years uh, without really naming it in that way. And I wanted to understand why there was this big hoopla now nationally um, at the National Science Foundation, at the National Institutes of Health, in all the major foundations, everybody was pushing for interdisciplinarity, more and more interdisciplinarity. 
And so I started a program when I was at the um, foundation to create seminars, faculty seminars, at three research universities, which have to remain unnamed, but not Stanford. Um, um, and to study how faculty who said they wanted to be part of an interdisciplinary group uh, went about doing that. And I realized that what we had here at Stanford in the Center for Research on Women was very unusual. We had faculty across fields who liked each other, who talked to each other, who were interested and open-minded in one another's fields. And I saw these seminars, I visited the seminars, and I began to see that this was really unusual. And so when I came back to Stanford, what I wanted to do was study these seminars. And I wanted to apply for a grant to the Ford Foundation, um, because I didn't want money from Atlanta Philanthropies to study what I had started. I wanted you know, a clean situation um, to, to do this. But you, know, you can't just apply for a grant. You have to have some um, knowledge of the literature and so on and so forth. And so when I said to uh, the people at Earwig that I wanted to do this, they said, oh, you're a perfect candidate for the Lit Fellowship. I said, oh, I am. <laughs> and thank you for realizing that although this wasn't directly about women, it really had a lot to do with women. And so um, I used the funding that I got to study up on the literature and to uh, get a grant from the Ford Foundation, which ultimately came through. And I wrote a book um, that was published in 2010 uh, on interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity uh, called um, Challenging Habits of Mind. And one of the things I learned in writing this book is that the key ingredient for success only one of these seminars was really successful. One was somewhat successful. Three were disasters. Um, the key is open-mindedness. And I began thinking about this in terms of two ways that one can be as an academic. You can play what we might call the doubting game, which is quintessential academic. Anybody says something, you say, huh? No, how could that be? You, you deny it, you doubt it before it's out of the person's mouth. The other possibility is to play the believing game. To say, oh, well, maybe this is interesting. This person seems smart. Let me think about, let me hear. Let me be open. And one of my subjects um, who was in one of these uh, less successful seminars was a professor of drama. And she taught me a tremendous amount. She said, you know, when I read a play, I don't critique it from the outset. I like to try on the ideas. I like to see what those ideas feel like. Maybe after a while I'll think, you know, they don't feel very good and I'll reject it. But in the meantime, I have an open mind. I'm trying on the ideas. And that is what allows interdisciplinarity to flourish. And that is what allows Iris to be so fantastic at this. I think all the characteristics that you outlined, Roberta, are exactly right. You know, Iris is quintessentially interdisciplinary. She's open-minded. She respects other people's ideas. And I must say, this is true for uh, the Clayman Institute in general. And that's why we've been successful over the years in understanding one another, in working with one another, and being um, interdisciplinary. All of the literature about interdisciplinarity talks about its promise. That all the research shows that when you have diverse opinions and diverse cultures coming together, you can re really create something innovative. But the literature also says that this promise rarely is achieved. Why? 
because people are not open-minded. People are too quick to put down ideas. I'll just give you one example from a colleague of mine who was involved in an interdis an economist, I'm an economist, um, involved in an interdisciplinary project on um, the environment. And I saw him on campus and I said, well, how's it going? He said, not very good. He said, if we could only get those people to think like economists, we'd make some progress on this. <laughs> so this is not Iris's style and we applaud you for it. Hello, I'm Jennifer Raymond and I'm a neuroscientist. I'm gonna share with you a little bit of my journey and start with a confession that up until just a few years ago, I really had little or no interest in gender issues at all. Um, and you know, back all the way in college, I remember taking a political philosophy class where the professor said, women's issues are the one set of issues on which people move to the left as they get older. And I very distinctly remember thinking, that will never happen to me. <laughs> um, but, and, it, and it took a couple of decades, but eventually I couldn't help but notice that the women around me in neuroscience were disappearing at an alarming rate. 50% uh, of the PhDs in neuroscience have gone to women for a long time, but at the PhD to postdoc transition, they're dropping, dropping out at about one and a half times the rate of men nationally, and at places like Stanford and our peer institutions, more than twice the rate of men. And for me, this was not just statistics. These were women that I knew, very talented women, who were saying things like, well, I love science, I just wish it wasn't so competitive. And I realized that although our neuroscience program is considered one of the very best anywhere, we were somehow failing to give these very talented women something that they needed to stay in the game. And so I started talking about this with one of my colleagues, Miriam Goodman, and uh, we realized that we better do something about it because if we didn't, it wasn't clear that anybody else was going to. And we thought that also if we could do something at Stanford to change the numbers, this would create a lot of pressure for our peer institutions to follow suit. Um, so we've put together a few programs for our trainees. Uh, a couple of them are now in their third or fourth year. And I won't go into the details, but I'd be happy to chat later in the, in the cocktail hour. Um, also in the last year and a half, I have been working with Hannah Valentine in the Office of Diversity and Leadership in the med school um, and have the unique, maybe uh, unique anywhere title of Associate Dean for Faculty Flexibility. <laughs> and my job there is to try to develop programs to address the work-life challenges that are driving so many trainees and especially women away from careers in academia. And um, the program that we are developing and piloting in the med school is uh, one that has two components. The first component is a career planning piece where we take faculty through the process of defining what their priorities are for their career and outside of their career and how they're gonna make the two fit together. And the second piece is uh, something we call a banking system that helps faculty to trade off responsibility abilities in a way that gives everyone just a little bit of breathing room when they need it. So we provide incentives for faculty to step up and do a little more teaching or service or mentoring work when they can. Um, we do this by giving them credits that they can use uh, to get support at work or at home. So a faculty member might do some extra mentoring, earn some credits, and then use those credits to get meals delivered to their family so they don't have to cook when they have a big grant deadline. Um, so we're really encouraged about this. We've actually gotten um, recognized by a Sloan Award and a lot of national media attention. Now, um, so that's just a little bit of my journey as a, I guess I'd uh, say a late bloomer <laughs> in the world of gender issues and social change. And I just wanted to say that as I've gotten more involved in these issues, uh, the Clayman Institute has been very helpful, and a lot of the things that you've created, Iris, have been very helpful to me. Um, because when I started uh, and decided that I wanted to do something to help our colleagues, I really had, I was totally clueless. I had no idea what to do. The only thing I knew was that exposure to female role models seemed to be helpful, and I figured at least I could do that. 
Um, but over the last few years, I've taken advantage of all the, in the expertise at Clayman, um, all of the programming, the seminars, the voice and influence program, and most recently this year, I am an Iris Lit Fellow and have been tremendously enjoying that. Um, and so now, as a result, I'm not quite as clueless as I was just a <laughs> very few years ago. And I've been able to pass along a lot of what I've learned to our trainees. And of course, at the Claimant, it's not just about content of the programming. It's also about the opportunity to make connections with women across the whole campus. Um, and that opportunity has been very important for me. I have gotten to know women who have been extremely helpful, providing support, advice, all kinds of expertise. Um, most recently, just at the very last Clayman lunch, um, I, one, one of the struggles we're working on now in the program for faculty that I described is thinking about the sustainability long term and how, how might that funding work. And we think that this program would pay for itself uh, because it could increase productivity and decrease turnover and the cost of retention and recruitment. Um, but I had no idea how to document this, how to actually study it. And I was just starting to realize I need someone with finance expertise, something I know nothing about. And don't you know, at the last claim and lunch, I found somebody <laughs> with that expertise who's willing to help, and we have an appointment now. Um, so there's been a lot of very practical benefits to me of being a fellow and, um, and all of the things that the Clayman offers have been helpful to me. And, and then just beyond the practical parts, I just love the sense of community there. Um, I love the chance to hear scholars from disciplines very different from my normal scientific world. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunities that have been created through all the work you've done. Thank you. I'm Marcia Stefanik, and I'm one of the co-directors of the Wisdom Institute, or the Wisdom Center. And um, my journey uh, has Iris kind of coming and going in big chunks, and I think that we actually see you as really the founder of um, another founder of our. We wouldn't exist if it wasn't for you. So first of all, where I I did women's health um, really before I met Iris Lit. Um, and I was basically doing the postmenopausal estrogen progestin intervention trial. They have long names. Uh, a lot of studies of hormones and heart disease. The HER study, which was heart and estrogen replacement uh, trial, and the Women's Health Initiative. So I was doing women's health big time. And um, somewhere in the midst of that, I actually met Linda Judice first, and I know that someone said she's here. So I, I feel that Linda Judice has been a really important uh, factor in my life and fortunately somewhere between there there's Linda and um, Linda was doing a lot of work with Iris pulled me in on that but I actually did go to the Center of Research on Women at one point and said how come there's no health here why don't they do anything with women's health and then when Iris came along she started doing women's health and I felt like why don't we have you know the research on women should include health as well. So I was doing a lot of that and somewhere along the line Linda Judice created the Women's Scholarly Concentration and um, I came in and did guest lectures on hormones and then when Linda left I started helping Mary Jacobson with a particular lecture that was on sex differences and I felt like I'm really not competent at doing this. I don't really know about sex differences. And so I ended up getting so into it that I created a course in Humbio that's called Sex Differences in Human Physiology and Disease. Got real excited about it. Uh, continued to actually, I now run that course on current topics and controversies in women's health. But in the midst of that, Londa Schiebinger came to me and said, you know, I need a biologist to work with me on this gendered innovation project. And so I started working with Londa on this, and she said, you know, we have this Iris Lit Award that could help you put some time aside to do this project. And I've continued working with her on that, and going to the Clayman Institute mm -hmm. during that era was this exciting piece where you start to realize, wow, there really is a lot of interaction between women's health, the gender issues, so on and so forth. And I have changed the name of my course now to Sex and Gender Differences in Human Physiology and Disease. I actually think I might have taken differences out because what's really interesting to me now is that we need to be not just looking at the differences. We do need to look at men and women. And I have a huge study of men in osteoporosis. 
and we have, you know, basically I've been doing women and heart disease. We went through this whole campaign, you know, it's an equal opportunity killer. Why don't you think of it as a woman's disease? So we've been, I've been doing this, but the gender part was really a special feature for me. And when I started to really get into this piece, I realized that, you know, biology needs to understand gender. We, don't, we should stop having this sex and sociocultural because they are interacting so profoundly and until we understand that interaction, we're not going to understand women's health and we're not going to understand a lot of other issues. And somewhere along the line, Lynn and I became, actually we became friends in the, in the peppy days, so back in the, 1980, the 1990, I guess we decided. But when, um, Lynn, when Lynn became the director of the women's health at, at Stanford, um, I became involved, became associate director with her, and we decided, we agreed that this has to go outside of OBGYN. We can't have women's health be OBGYN. And so we actually, uh, I think Dean Pizzo is here, so we have to give him a great honor for basically making wisdom happen because he was very supportive of our uh, creating this new center, and our goal is lifespan. So Lynn, as you might know, is, does assisted re reproductive technology. So we go from the blastocyst all the way to, I do all, all of my cohorts now are aging. So aging women is definitely my thing. And aging men, I have men that are 100 years old now in these studies. So lifespan is a really important part of it. And in terms of the question that Iris mentioned about do you do this, we wanted to do a global women's health conference. We went to Michelle Berry and she says, well, I do global health, but I don't do women's health. And we said, well, we do women's health, but we don't do global health, so let's get together. Mm -hmm. And we are going to have in May a global women's health conference that will put those two pieces together. And the other one that you mentioned, longevity, we went to Laura Carsonson and said, you know, we really want to do sex differences and women across the lifespan and really work together. So we've got that in the, the works. And so the bottom line is, this is something that really, Iris, we are taking your banner and going forward. And I will tell you that we now have new courses that we've created um, to kind of follow up with sex and, and gender differences in human physiology disease. Um, I, we've just put in a new, we're creating a new class for spring that's called Challenging Sex and Gender Dichotomies in Medicine so that we can really say, hey, you know, we have to, we have to do this, but we have to do everything in between and understand that we're all somewhere in between. So that's an exciting part of the mission of the Wisdom Center. We have seed grants we just put out. We just got uh, 13 great proposals to look at sex differences, the requirement that is you had to have at least two departments in the School of Medicine. We encourage going to another school. Next year, our seed grants will say that you have to be one in the School of Medicine and one has to be in another school. So we're gonna go out that way. So basically, everything you taught us in terms of your values, we have embraced, and um, I know that Shelley is doing an amazing job at Clayman. This is part of our campus engagement, so our mission is research, education, clinical interface, which Lynn is playing a major role in that, and basically campus engagement. We want the medical school to be completely integrated with the campus, and this is our first, so actually this was the first thing we said is, Shelley, let's do Clayman and Wisdom together. So we're very excited about that, and with that, I am going to, again, thank Iris very much, and, and Linda, Judice as well, and uh, Phil. But I also would like to go ahead and introduce our, our keynote speaker, and we did ask Iris, Iris, we'd like you to be able to feature one of your ment mentees, and she immediately came up with Deborah Katzman. So that was like a no-brainer for her. And I'll just very, do it very quickly because I think it's better to hear you than to hear me. Um, so uh, Dr. Deborah Katzman is professor of pediatrics at um, in the University of Toronto, and she actually has had a long career in eating disorders, which I think is what we're going to hear about. And I think rather than say anything more, I'm just going to let you come up and show your stuff. So thank you so much uh, for that introduction, and it is really a tremendous honor and privilege for me to be here this evening to honor my mentor, my teacher, and friend, Iris Lett. It's also very special to be back at Stanford, a place that really feels like home to me and a place that brings back so many fond memories. 
When I was invited to this very special celebration in honor of Iris, I was asked to talk about my work. I thought, how can I possibly talk about my work at an evening honoris, honoring Iris? So I checked back with the organizers and they reiterated that they would really appreciate it if I could share some of the work that I've been involved in over the past years. And so this is what I've done. As I was thinking about this presentation, I realized that the work that I'm currently doing and will be sharing with you this evening is a direct result of my work with Iris as an adolescent medicine fellow and junior faculty at Stanford. I also want to qualify this by saying that this is not my work alone, but rather the work of numerous colleagues and collaborators. I also want to clarify that this work would not have been possible without the mentorship and support of Iris. So it gives me great pleasure to share this work with you in honor of Iris. Let me begin by telling you how I met Iris and how she truly helped shape my career. While a medical student at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, I had an inkling that I wanted to work with adolescents. At that time, adolescent medicine was well established in the United States, but it was an emerging field in Canada. During my medical school days, I had a number of powerful and memorable experiences working with adolescent patients. I felt privileged to be able to work with young people and have an opportunity, even if in some small way, to help them grow and thrive. I did an elective in adolescent medicine at Montefiore Hospital at the Albert Einstein School of Medicine. And this again confirmed that I wanted to devote my career to caring for adolescents. During my pediatric residency at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, I started to explore various adolescent medicine fellowships. As I mentioned, I knew I wanted to do adolescent health, but more than ever, I wanted the privilege of learning from and working with a woman by the name of Iris Litt. I did not know Dr. Litt personally at that time, but I did know about her. I knew that Dr. Litt was a founding leader in the field of adolescent medicine. She was also one of the first women to do research and publish in the field of adolescent health. She was interested in the health problems of adolescent women and was also involved in understanding the interaction between the psychosocial phenomena and the biological features in adolescents, all of which were of particular interest to me. For all these reasons, Iris seemed like the perfect person to work with. And so I applied for and was fortunate to be accepted into the Robert Wood Johnson General Pediatric Academic Development Fellowship Training Program at Stanford, and most fortunate to have the opportunity of working closely with Iris. This was one of the best career decisions that I ever made. I came to Stanford fresh out of residency training and had minimal experience in adolescent health and little to no experience in clinical research. Despite this, Iris helped ease my adjustment to my postdoctoral training. She taught me the unique skills of interacting with and caring for adolescents and their families. She gently guided me through my very first research project. She introduced me to important professional opportunities, and she connected me to ad the adolescent health community. Most importantly, she taught me about passion, the passion for working with and caring for adolescents. While at Stanford, the majority of my clinical work was working with adolescents with eating disorders, specifically young girls with anorexia nervosa. This clinical work stimulated and informed my research focus for, the, for understanding and treating the medical complications in adolescents with anorexia nervosa. For those of you who are not familiar with this disorder, Anorexia nervosa is a severe and often life-threatening mental disorder characterized by restrictive eating, repeated and obsessive fears of being fat, and the voluntary pursuit of thinness. Many people with anorexia nervosa see themselves as overweight, even when they are clearly underweight. Eating, food, and weight control become obsessions. Adolescents with anorexia nervosa typically weigh themselves repeatedly, portion food very carefully, and eat very small quantities of only certain foods. 
This disorder frequently develops during the teen years. Although this disorder affects both adolescent females and males, it is much more common among females. Anorexia nervosa frequently coexists with other illnesses such as depression, substance abuse, or anxiety disorders. It is a treatable medical illness, and most adolescents do recover with treatment. However, anorexia nervosa is a life-threatening disorder. It has the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric disorder. Adolescents with anorexia nervosa are 10 times more likely to die compared to their healthy peers. Many young people with this disorder develop severe medical complications secondary to their low body weight and malnourished state. Virtually every system in the body is affected by this disorder. In fact, Irish published, published the seminal article, Medical Complications of Eating Disorders in Adolescence, in the Journal of Pediatrics in 1988. It is still one of the most highly cited papers on medical complications in adolescents with eating disorders. This was the first paper of its kind, and it was this work that really shaped my academic interests. It was during my days at Stanford that we began to appreciate that adolescents with eating disorders were very different from their adult counterparts. In particular, these young people suffered unique medical complications, all of which impact adolescent physical, psychological, and social growth and development. Specifically, these young people have growth impairment, pubertal delay, low bone mineral density, structural brain changes, cognitive deficits, and mood changes. The majority of adolescents with anorexia nervosa either lose their menstrual period or have irregular menstrual periods. The reason for this is very complicated. Available evidence suggests that a number of factors, including low body weight, low body fat, low mood, abnormal eating attitudes and behaviors, and physical activity may all contribute and play a role in the loss of menstrual periods or irregular menses in adolescents with anorexia nervosa. The loss of menstrual periods results in very, very low levels of the hormone estrogen. Estrogen is a very important hormone that is produced mainly by the ovaries, but is also produced by fat cells in the adrenal gland. Estrogen has many important functions and is, and is involved in the onset of puberty and plays a role in the development of secondary sexual characteristics, such as breast and pubic hair development. It also helps regulate the menstrual cycle. In addition, available data suggests that estrogen is important in bone mineralization or formation, plays a significant role in cognition, and is strongly implicated in the regulation of mood. My work has really focused on understanding the role estrogen plays in modulating the medical complications in adolescents with anorexia nervosa, specifically bone, cognition, and mood. In addition, I have also been interested in the role that estrogen plays in the treatment of these medical complications. Let me begin by reviewing our work on bone mineral density in adolescents with anorexia nervosa. My first work in this area started here at Stanford with Laura Backrack and Iris, when our group was the first to report that these young women have low bone mineral density, or brittle bones, and that this occurred very, very early on in the illness. It was clear that these adolescents were at increased risk for bone fractures. Subsequently, we followed these women over time to see what became of their low bone mineral density. Those who gained weight increased their bone mineral density, whereas those who stayed the same weight or those who lost weight lost further bone mineral density. It seemed that weight restoration was a very, very important therapeutic modality. However, weight restoration in these young women can be extremely challenging. So in the absence of optimal weight gain or the resumption of their menstrual period, we were interested in finding a possible treatment for the low bone mineral density. We knew that bone mineral density increased during puberty. This is when there were increasing levels of estrogen. 
And we also knew that bone density decreased during menopause. This is when there were decreases in blood levels of estrogen. So it seemed logical that estrogen might be a good therapeutic modality to use to enhance bone mineral density in these patients. So in collaboration with my colleagues at Harvard, we recently published a randomized clinical trial looking at the effects of physiologic estrogen replacement on bone accrual rates in adolescents with anorexia nervosa. We found that physiologic estrogen administration caused significant increase in bone density at the spine and the hip compared with adolescents who were given a placebo. Although there were significant increases in this bone, bone mineral density, physiologic estrogen did not result in a complete catch-up back to normal bone mineral density. Girls with anorexia still had lower bone mineral density than their healthy weight controls did. This, however, was the first study to really show that physiologic estrogen could be a potential therapeutic option for optimizing bone mass in this population, and we're currently building on this work. In addition to this work, we have been studying brain structure and cognitive function in young women with anorexia nervosa. We know that adolescence is a period of brain and cognitive maturation. There are significant increases in the various matters of the brain during adolescence, both white and gray matter. Animal studies and studies in adults with anorexia nervosa have shown that starvation does indeed compromise brain development. Our group and Neville Golden's group showed that structural abnormalities are indeed found in the brain of adolescents with anorexia nervosa. These changes are also among the earliest and most striking physical consequences in adolescents with anorexia nervosa. In the past, it had been assumed that these brain changes were reversible with weight restoration. However, our group has shown that not all of these changes are completely reversible with weight restoration. We were concerned that if there were changes in the structure of the brain, then there might be associated changes in the cognitive function of these young people. This concern was also supported by our clinical impression from working with these young people. Many of these young people display challenges in their judgment and their memory, and many complain of having difficulty focusing both in and outside of school. And there are others who have reported challenges in learning new material. So we decided to study the cognitive function in these young people and found that young people with a history of adolescent onset anorexia nervosa had deficits in cognitive functioning over a broad range of neuropsychological domains compared with healthy controls. Specifically, they have problems with learning and memory, attention, visuospatial skills, executive functioning, <coughs> abstraction, and the use of strategy. We thought that perhaps, just like the brain structure, that these cognitive changes were related to their weight, but we soon learned that they were not. When we looked to the literature to try and understand this, we found that there was a body of evidence that suggested that cognition was impaired in women who had low levels of circulating estrogen. For instance, impaired cognition had been reported in postmenopausal women, in surgically menopausal women, women with premature ovarian failure, and girls with Turner syndrome. So when we looked at the impact of estrogen on cognition in our patient population, we found that those who were not menstruating or had irregular menstrual periods, i.e. lower levels of estrogen, had impaired cognitive testing whereas those who had resumed menstrual periods or were on estrogen in the form of the oral contraceptive pill had better cognition. Cognition was highest among those who had never had anorexia nervosa. Amenorrhea or menstrual irregularity, a proxy for low estrogen levels, appear to be associated with cognitive impairments in anorexia nervosa. Again, pointing to an association between estrogen and anorexia nervosa. Finally, we recently had an opportunity to study mood changes in adolescents with anorexia nervosa. We conducted a randomized clinical trial of girls with the disorder 
and found that they had a significant reduction in anxiety when given estrogen replacement compared to those teens with anorexia nervosa who were given a placebo. Those adolescents who had the greatest increases in the estrogen levels experienced the greatest reductions in anxiety. So as you can see, these treatment studies have highlighted a connection between anorexia nervosa and estrogen. Estrogen is an important hormone in young women with anorexia nervosa. Our understanding of the role of estrogen in this disorder is really in its infancy, but our work and the work of others has shown that the association between estrogen and anorexia nervosa could lead to a better understanding of some potential treatment options for the physical, psychological, and cognitive health of young people who develop these devastating disorders. This gives you a bit of a picture of the work that I've been working on since my formative days here at Stanford, working with Iris. It was under Iris's mentorship that fostered my love for the care of adolescents with eating disorders and inspired me to develop a deeper understanding of these complicated disorders. Iris challenged my thinking. She helped me understand this disorder in new ways. And she helped me realize that research is a fundamental part of my everyday interactions with patients. So it is a great honor that I pay, pay tribute to a true leader in the field of adolescent health and a role model for women in medicine. The contributions of Iris Slit are innumerable, as is her incomparable work and her advocacy for adolescent health and gender in medicine. Finally, her warm and natural interpersonal skills promote a collaborative atmosphere for everyone she works with and for those individuals she leads. My goal from those early days of my career to now is to live up to the ideals of my mentor, Dr. Iris Litt. If I could have an impact on the lives of my patients and families and my trainees to a fraction of the degree of Iris Litt, then my career will have been worth it. Iris, thank you for your devotion to all of us who you have trained for your immeasurable contributions to the advancement of adolescent health, for your ability to educate and share knowledge to adolescent healthcare trainees, and for your tireless commitment to improving our knowledge and care of adolescents around the world. Please join me in honoring and congratulating Iris for all of her outstanding accomplishments. Thank you. Hi, I'm just curious about, since we've learned so much from the Women's Health Initiative about estrogen and long-term effects and how it's been used, if you're treating adolescents with estrogen, what are you learning or is it too soon to know about the long-term effects or do you not have to worry if it's in adolescence? So um, that, you know, the short answer is we don't know. We're just beginning. These are studies are just beginning. Um, we know that lots of adolescents uh, use uh, estrogen in the form of oral contraception, and so far those have been um, relatively, I would say, in most cases, very, very safe. Um, the estrogens, of course, that we were using in our own study were also uh, used with small amounts of progesterone, so these were not, um, uh, this was not estrogen that was uh, not covered with progesterone. So this, the short answer is we don't know, but um, I think we're gonna learn a lot more as we follow these young people who have been on estrogen for long periods of time. We don't actually use estrogen because these are studies where there's a study of an N of one, so we don't use estrogen right now to treat these particular medical complications. This is just um, sort of helping us understand um, the implications of estrogen and all of these various medical complications. So it's not something that we would necessarily recommend. You're welcome. Do we know what causes AN and is it possible that there's any kind of causal relationship between an imbalance of this hormone and? Yes, so that, um, that's something that um, is being looked at right now. 
Um, the cause of anorexia nervosa is really unknown. It's thought to be very or quite multifactorial. But we know that anorexia nervosa is incredibly heritable. And there is some sort of genetic component, probably, to, uh, or genetic vulnerability, if you will, to the develop of anorexia nervosa. Studies done by Kelly Klump and her group at Michigan State has actually looked at twin studies and this genetic vulnerability. And what they have found is that um, even in genetically vulnerable young people before puberty, there's no increase of developing anorexia nervosa. It's only with the onset of puberty and the onset of increases in estrogen in these uh, genetically vulnerable young people that they develop eating disorders. So there's something about a genetically vulnerable young person and estrogen and the way the brain actually manages estrogen that may indeed contribute to or confer risk, if you will, of developing anorexia nervosa. So I'm uh, Shelley Carell. I'm the current director of what is now the Clayman Institute for Gender Research. And um, my job is to wrap up this lovely celebration and to help us think about how we might move forward and build off of the wonderful legacy that Iris um, has created for us here. And like everyone I think that's spoken before, I would just like to start off by saying how much personally I feel like I've benefited from what you've done here for us um, at Stanford and the paths you've created for us in terms of going forward. So thank you, Iris. Um, as I was thinking about what I was going to say today, and believe me, I won't take long, I know we're, we're a little over time, but as I was thinking about what uh, I was going to say today, I, I ran through this little thought experiment in my head, and I said, what if Iris Litt hadn't come to Stanford? And, you know, if, you if we all think about that, you know, from where we sit, I think we quickly realize that Stanford would be a very different place, not just in the medical school, but all over the campus, and it would be a much lesser place. So we're very glad you did come to Stanford. Um, let me just say a little bit about, uh, I want to talk about just three broad areas where I think um, Iris has made really a profound contribution. And here I will be um, uh, sh you know, making some comments that I think others have made earlier, but I'll just underline them a bit. The first area is certainly um, in the area of sex and gender research. Um, as you now know, um, Iris was the director of what is now the Clayman Institute from 1990 to 1997. And um, she did so many things while being director to really solidify the Clayman Institute's place nationally, including, um, I think, securing what eventually became the endowment um, that changed the name to the Clayman Institute. But to me, one of the things that I think is really most important about what uh, Iris did is she connected the institute with the medical school. And if you look at uh, research institutes around the country, a lot of times when they call themselves interdisciplinary, what that means is they have social scientists and humanists talking together. But here at Stanford, the Stanford Medical School is by far the largest school on campus. We weren't going to be much if we couldn't have a good connection with the medical school. And she really made that happen. And through the Lit Fellows program that lives on today, that, that continues. Um, that fellowship program has very much continued to ha involve people from the medical school in the daily life of the institute. And as you've seen here, it's not only brought people into the institute, but those people have gone on and carried Iris's legacy on um, around the campus. And so we're very delighted to have uh, the new uh, Wisdom Center on campus, which I think has grown directly out of the work that Iris started. Um, in addition, a thing that I, one thing, a big contribution that I think Iris made that we haven't talked about much today is that she's done a lot to advance women's leadership here at Stanford. And again, this has come about um, in a, in not only herself being an important women leader on campus, but through the fellows program itself. Um, so a lot of the fellows that we've brought in have gone on to do really important things on the campus that have enhanced the status of women faculty on campus. You heard from Jennifer Raymond, who's a current uh, fellow earlier, and the work, the very important research she's doing and intervention she's doing in the medical school to reduce some of the work-life conflict that drives women out of academic medicine. She works in the dean's office with Hannah Valentine, who is a former fellow at the Clayman Institute. Um, Hannah Valentine is a Caesar, senior associate dean in the medical school and has perhaps done more than anyone else on campus to promote women as leaders on campus and to promote women faculty. Um, Sabine Giraud, another one of our former fellows, is leading a campus-wide study for, of all seven schools where they're collecting data on women faculty, men faculty, and women and men staff to ask who's in leadership positions and what kind of resources are they controlling. And all of this has come out of, of, of the Iris Lit Fellowship Program. 
The third and final area that I will just underline, and this has come out a lot in people's comments, is, um, is Iris's contribution to spurring interdisciplinary research on the Stanford campus. She's done this both as her direct as a director of what is now the Clayman Institute and also at CASPUS. And as I think about it, it's really hard for me to think of any one person on campus who's done more than Iris to establish the kind of connections between scholars that have that have really brought about the interdisciplinary research for with for which this campus is so known. So we thank her very much for that. So as I think about how we might go forward and build on this legacy, um, to me, it's, uh, I, I feel like Iris has made some very smooth paths for us. Um, she's laid the groundwork for us to really be able to almost run downhill, if you will, and, uh, and make, continue making progress in these important areas. In the area of sex and gender research, um, the, the Clayman Institute is now, I think, recognized to be one of the major players in this space, and we really owe a lot to Iris for that. We're, going, we're definitely going forward in this regard. Um, in terms of advancing women's leaders, we have a lot of work to do on the Stanford campus, but the, the fellows that have come out of the medical school and through the LIT program, I think, are really leading that charge. And we have certainly have a firm foundation on, to which we to continue to grow interdisciplinary scholarship here um, at Stanford. So again, I know I speak for lots of people in the room, Iris, and we, we, that you've done so much for gender research. You've done so much for us personally. Stanford is a better place because you decided to come here. So thank you very much. Now it's time to celebrate. Um, so I'd like to invite you all over to Sarah House, the home of the Clayman Institute, where we will have some appetizers and can raise a glass uh, and toast to Iris Litt. Uh, Sarah House, where the Institute lives, um, has long been the home of the Institute. We've had 11 different directors. Um, we've been, um, lots of different topics we've studied, on, we've studied and that, that house itself has had three different locations. But for a very long time, since almost the beginning, this has been the home of what is, what is the Clayman Institute. Institute now, so we, we think it would be a very special place to have a closing celebration and give a toast to Iris Litt. Thank you, Iris, and thank you all. Thank you.